What's up, guys? As you know, the NBA playoffs are almost at an end right now, so I'm going to keep riding the wave of NBA videos until they are over. And that's why my newest NBA video, I'm going to look at my all-decade teams from every single decade in the history of the NBA since the 1950s. Now, there's a couple guidelines I want to drop before I start the video. I'm going positionless, meaning I don't care about guard, guard, forward, forward, center. It's just the five best players overall from that decade, regardless of position. I am also using Using just specifically the 10 seasons from that decade. Now, this seems pretty self-explanatory, but this is not a career-based video. For example, when it comes to the 2010s, I'm looking specifically at what all these players accomplished between the 2009-10 seasons and the 2018-19 seasons. And when it comes to the 60s and 70s, I do not care about what a player did in the ABA. This is strictly what they did in the NBA. So guys like Dr. J, Artis Gilmore, you're out of luck. So get ready ready to get butt hurt right after this. I want to take a moment and say thank you to DraftKings for sponsoring this video. Basketball fans, you already know what time it is. The NBA Finals are here, which means it's your last chance to get in on all the action this season with my partners over at DraftKings Sportsbook. Today's video sponsor, DraftKings, is bringing the high stakes action to all new customers. New customers who bet just $5 will get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use my promo code Barry to bet on the last games of the season. That's right. New customers who bet just $5 will get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Wondering what you could use $200 in bonus bets on? Try DraftKings Same Game Parlays, where you can combine multiple bets from the same game into one big bet for a shot at an even bigger payout. If mobile sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. You can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where they offer cash prize contests for nearly every sport. Download the DraftKings Sports Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code Barry, bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code Barry only at DraftKings Sportsbook. 1950s. Now, I know that most of you don't really give a shit about the 1950s NBA or really any era of the NBA before Magic and Bird or specifically Michael Jordan because every NBA debate basically devolves into LeBron versus Jordan, LeBron versus Kobe, LeBron versus Steph. Most of you people don't actually like basketball, so I'll make this as quick as possible. Starting it off with George Michael. Mikan. Mikan was basically the 1950s equivalent of Shaq or MJ. He was the first real superstar and he won four championships with the Lakers, although his career was pretty short. That being said, when you're talking era specific, he is one of the most dominant players in the NBA, even though I think we all know he would probably be Mason Plumlee if he played today. No offense. Bob Cousy. Yes, that's right. The Houdini of the hardwood, Bob Cousy, who was extremely inefficient, never shot over 40% in any regular season of his career makes this list because again this is era specific would Kuzi be a good player in today's nba of course not he'd be a lesser version of tj mcconnell but for his time he was basically magic johnson or steve nash leading the league in assists in each of the last seven seasons of the 1950s he also won two of his six rings in the 1950s although he didn't win anything until bill russell came along but no matter what you think of Kuzi, you cannot deny that his cameo in blue chips was absolutely amazing Paul Arison. Yes, that's right. Paul Arison once led the league in field goal percentage, shooting below 45%. He also led the league in scoring twice. But more importantly, and I made sure to leave this in there, he voluntarily skipped two seasons of his NBA career in his prime to serve in the Marines. So if you say any negative things about Mr. Arison in the comments, I will find you. And his playoff numbers outside of 1957 when he was hurt are actually pretty darn good regardless of era, including winning a championship in 1956 with the Philadelphia Warriors. Pitchin' Paul had game regardless of era. Dolph Shays. Much like Bob Cousy and many other players from the 1950s, Dolph Shays had terrible shooting percentages and would most likely not be relevant in today's era. However, he could score, he could rebound, and he could pass a little bit. He also upped his game in the playoffs. Now, admittedly, it's not that difficult to increase your game efficiency-wise when you're shooting below 40% every single season, but nevertheless, he did so winning a championship in 1955. He also had the most win shares of any player in the entire decade if you get off on advanced stats like that. Also, his son Danny Shays played a long time in the NBA, so congrats to Dolph on having sex. And finally, Bob Pettit. Bob Pettit, one of the earliest superstars in the history of the league. The bombarder from Baton Rouge, as he was known, talks like Foghorn Leghorn, but he had game. Although he would continue to play great into the 60s, in just the 50s, he had two scoring titles, 
two MVPs and a championship in 1958, which is the only time between 1957 and 1966 that a team other than the Celtics won a championship. Although to be fair, Bill Russell was injured in 1958, so some might even dare call Bob Pettit the Steph Curry of his era. My player of the decade, George Mikan. To me, the combination of relative individual dominance and four championships, even though he did not play for basically half the decade, gives him the top spot for me. The 1960s. Wilt Chamberlain. This was a pretty easy choice, as Wilt is one of the greatest players of all time, won seven scoring titles, eight rebounding titles, and a championship, as well as four MVPs. He also somehow avoided any paternity suits, despite having sexual relations at least 50 times a day in between games. Perhaps if he was focused focused more on playing instead of laying, he might have won more championships. But despite that, and having the misfortune of having to go up against the Dynasty Celtics, Chamberlain's individual dominance is so extreme that he is one of the few players that everybody pretty much unanimously agrees would translate to the current era because he was arguably the greatest athlete in the history of not just the NBA, but possibly sports. Oscar Robertson. The Big O was incredible. He is most famous for averaging a triple-double which Russell Westbrook has basically made irrelevant now, but for a long time it was very important. He was extremely efficient, especially for a guard in his era. He won seven assist titles in the 60s and a scoring title, as well as an MVP in 1964. The one issue with Oscar the Grouch, as he was known, is that he really didn't have as much team success as you would expect, even considering that he was playing in an era with Russell and Wilt. But nevertheless, he was a baller, and is rightfully considered one of the greatest point guards of all time. Jerry West. While Chamberlain versus Russell was the biggest debate among NBA fans back in the day, Jerry West versus Oscar Robertson was another that wasn't quite as popular, but still very interesting to look at. West is known by many names, The Logo or Mr. Clutch, even though he was famously known for losing the most finals in the history of the NBA. He was also known for having incredibly shitty luck and consistently raised his individual performances in the postseason, including averaging over 40 points a game in the 1965 playoffs. West unfortunately went 0 for 6 in the NBA Finals in the 60s and still remains the only losing player to ever win Finals MVP, which he did in 1969. If there's any person that has reason to hate the Bill Russell Celtics more than Jerry West, I haven't seen him. The other thing is that his numbers could have been even better if they had a three-point line when he was playing. And in my opinion, he might be the best player in the history of the league to never win an MVP. Elgin Baylor. Baylor and West formed one of the greatest duos in the history of the league despite never winning a championship together. Before Baylor came along, the NBA was mostly a horizontal game, aka a bunch of white guys who couldn't jump. Baylor brought some verticality to it, and the old heads loved to compare him as a precursor to Dr. J and Michael Jordan. Although injuries would later sap him of some of his effectiveness, pre-injury Baylor was a monster both as a scorer and as a rebounder. And to this day, he still holds the single game record for most points scored in an NBA Finals game, which happened in 1962. He averaged 41 points, 18 rebounds, and 4 assists in the 1962 Finals, but lost. I guess he just didn't have enough killer instinct. And finally, Bill Russell. I have to admit that Bill Russell is one of the toughest players for me to judge because even for his era, he was not a great offensive player. He was a talented passer, an amazing rebounder, and considered by many to be the greatest defender of all time. And to be honest, that distinction seems to have some merit once you look at how he dominated defensive win shares and how amazing his Celtics teams always were defensively relative to their era. Russell never once led his own team in scoring, and he remains the only legend that I have my reservations about how he would transfer to today's game. But my god, the guy won 9 out of 10 years in the 1960s, and regardless of teammate support or level of competition, no other player or superstar has ever repeated that type of dominance. And at a certain point, the team accomplishments become too much to ignore. Player of the decade, Wilt Chamberlain. I gotta be honest, it sounds a little bit weird to give Wilt the nod after I just gave Russell credit for winning 90% of the championships in the era, but to me, it's player of the decade, and Wilt was the best individual player, but this debate has been going on for nearly 60 years now. Do you take Wilt's stats or Russell's team wins and head-to-head -head success? But I just could not ignore Wilt's individual production, even though he is one of the biggest playoff chokers of all time.
the 1970s, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. In my opinion, the 1970s are what I consider the lost decade of the NBA. There was never one dominant dynasty, the league was racked with drugs, and the ABA sapped a lot of the talent for half the decade. But the one constant the entire decade was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar dominating and putting up historic numbers. He won five MVPs in the decade, as well as a championship and a finals MVP. My only gripe with Kareem is that for being the clear-cut best player in the decade by miles, he was only able to bring home one championship. Now, to be fair, he came within one game of winning a second championship in 1974, but still, he also missed the playoffs back-to-back -back seasons in his prime in 75 and 76. But nevertheless, there is no debating that Kareem was the best player in the league in the 1970s. But as you'll see, the star power drops off pretty quickly after him. Walt Frazier. Frazier is a legend both on and off the court. In the decade, he won two championships and very well could have and probably should have been named the 1970 Finals MVP instead of Willis Reed when he had an absolutely dominant Game 7 performance to bring home the Knicks' first championship ever. Clyde was also known for raising his game in the postseason as his efficiency was incredible. A complete all-around player, he is one that could adapt to any era and excel in any era. Congrats to Clyde on weaving and achieving his way onto this list. Bob McAdoo. McAdoo had three straight 30-point-per-game seasons, including winning MVP in the early 70s. He kind of gets forgotten about because the entire 70s decade really gets forgotten about, and he played for the Buffalo Braves, aka the Clippers, before they moved. His teams also never really won anything with him in charge, but the guy could score the basketball, and people who saw him play compare him to Kevin Durant for what it's worth, minus the emotional threshold of a teenage girl. Bob Lanier. To me, Lanier is one of the most underrated players in the history of the league. He was a consistent 20-25 point per game scorer, as well as a great rebounder and a capable passer. Really, the guy just did everything well. Unfortunately, his teams never won anything in his prime, so he gets forgotten about, much like a lot of other great players from the 70s. When you look at his raw stats and his advanced stats, like I said, he really doesn't get nearly enough credit for how good he was. And finally, Elvin Hayes. The Big E, as he was known, or the Big Enigma, was a little bit of a volume scorer in terms of getting his points, but he was a dominant rebounder and also blocked a lot of shots and got a lot of steals. However, he was also known to be a bit of a flake, especially in the postseason, although he was able to win a championship in 1978. But even if he was a bit of a flake, him and Wes Unseld combined to create one of the best front courts in the history of the league. And it's pretty sad to say, but the last time Washington was title contenders was with Hayes in the late 70s. So yeah, it's been a long suffering stretch for Washington Wizards slash Bullets fans. And I just realized how much of a missed opportunity it was that Gilbert Arenas didn't play for Washington when they were named the Bullets. Player of the decade, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Like I said, my only gripe is that he could have won a couple more championships, but there's no debate here. The 1980s, Magic Johnson. Famous condom hater Magic Johnson also used to be very, very good at basketball before he became a legendary tweeter. In the 1980s, he won three MVPs, although they were kind of questionable, as well as five championships and three finals MVPs. He also missed the finals just two times in 10 years during the decade, and his presence, along with Larry Bird, was a big reason why the NBA soared in popularity after the nightmarish PR decade of the 1970s when finals games were on tape delay. Larry Bird. You can't really talk about Magic Johnson or Larry Bird or vice versa without mentioning the other pretty quickly as their legacies are intertwined as they entered the league together in the same year in 1980, met three times in the finals and exchanged MVPs and championships for basically the entire decade. Really not much I can say about Bird that you already don't know. He came in, had an immediate impact on the Celtics and his three years stretch in the mid 80s when he won three straight MVPs as well as two of his three championships is one of the best stretches by any player in the history of the league. As I've said before in previous videos of mine, I think Bird's playoff career gets a little bit overrated as he only had a couple truly legendary postseason runs compared to his reputation, but still, you can't talk about the 80s NBA without Larry Bird. And if he wasn't so inclined to pave his mother's driveway, maybe he would have ended up playing another four or five years instead of retiring early because of back problems. Michael Jordan. Believe it or not, there was a time when Michael Jordan wasn't winning championships every single season, and he was considered to be a ball hog who was a great individual player that you could never win with because he wasn't an all-around player like Magic and Bird. It's ironic because a lot of MJ's best individual
individual seasons came in the 80s before he won any championships, as I alluded to. But still, even though MJ wasn't winning rings yet, largely because he actually played against great teams as opposed to the dog shit he was facing in the 90s, he still was able to win three scoring titles, an MVP, a Defensive Player of the Year, and also had some memorable moments in the postseason, such as his 63-point game versus the Celtics in 1986 after missing most of the season with a broken foot. Luckily for Michael, he wasn't born a couple years earlier, and he wouldn't have to face the Showtime Lakers or the Bird Celtics or the Bad Boy Pistons more than he did. But the 80s proved that Jordan was a great player regardless of situation, as well as one of the greatest athletes and fun-to-watch players that we've ever seen. I just wish that his fans were a little bit more self-aware when they give excuses for Jordan losing in the 80s while tearing down other certain players for losing series where they put up amazing numbers against far superior teams. Moses Malone. Moses had one of the most interesting careers of any all-time great. He played for a bunch of teams, including four in the decade of the 80s, while also winning two MVPs, a championship, and a finals MVP early on in the decade. I do have some reservations about how he would translate to later eras, as he wasn't a great passer and a bit slow-footed defensively, but he was a man of his time, and there's no doubt that he took full advantage of it. He was also the first prep-to-pro superstar the game ever saw. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem's decade in the 80s wasn't nearly as dominant individually as he was in the 70s, but he was still able to squeak in another MVP, a finals MVP, and win five of his six rings. I do love how basically after 1981, he just decided to give up rebounding for good. And I do find it interesting that the first decade of his career, he won five of his six MVPs and one of his six rings. And in the second decade of his career, he won five of his rings and only one of his six MVPs. Just a little something to consider when ranking him all time, which I consider him to be a top three player ever. And the fact that he was still averaging about 23 points a game and 26 points per game in the playoffs at age 38 says a lot about his greatness. I do want to quickly point out that at age 38, he had about 10,000 fewer career minutes played in the league than LeBron does at 38. So for the LeBron haters seeing this video, just some more context for you to consider. Player of the decade, Magic Johnson. Some people would say it should be tied between Magic and Bird, but I give Magic the edge because I think he was a more consistent postseason and finals performer than Bird was. Johnson was so good at basketball that he has the best porn name of all time and is also famous for having HIV and people don't even connect the two. The 1990s, aka the most overrated decade of any sport in sports history. Michael Jordan. You pretty much know all of MJ's accomplishments in the 1990s by now. Six rings, six finals MVPs, four MVPs, a bunch of scoring titles, and whatnot. He lost only two playoff series the entire decade when he wasn't quote-unquote retired. You could easily argue that accomplishments-wise, it's the greatest decade any player has ever had in NBA history without applying any context, of course. MJ benefited from all the great teams in the 80s, aging out, and no team in the West ever winning the conference more than twice the entire decade. But credit to MJ and the Bulls. They took advantage of a weak era. But as they say, the winners get to write the story. Hakeem Olajuwon. If there was any player in the 90s that could have given MJ's Bulls massive issues that they never had to face in the finals, it was Hakeem. Simply put, Hakeem's legacy was cemented after his back-to-back -back amazing title runs in 94 and 95. If you wanted to be a hater, you could say that Hakeem benefited from Jordan being out of the league for most of those two years, even though technically MJ played 95 and he lost to the Magic in the second round. But let's keep that under wraps because it doesn't go with the narrative. I'm just surprised that he wasn't able to win the conference more than twice in the 90s. But there's no question that Hakeem is one of the great postseason performers of all time. Charles Barkley. It's very rare for a player to be both an overachiever and an underachiever at the same time, but that's kind of what Barkley was. He was famously undersized for a power forward at six foot four, but he was a ferocious rebounder. The reason he played power forward as opposed to shooting guard or a guard role is because he wasn't good at shooting, but he made up for that with his incredible post play. That said, he was also famous for consistently coming into seasons out of shape and for really not trying on defense, which might have led to him never winning a championship. He only made one finals, which famously came against MJ's Bulls in 93, but wasn't able to seal the deal. When you hear Barkley talk about really anything, but especially basketball, it's very hard to remember that he was one of the best players ever. And to me, he was the second best non-big man of the 90s behind MJ. Karl Malone. In the 90s, one of the biggest debates was who was the best power forward in the league? Was it Karl Malone or Barkley? I've already touched on Malone, no offense, and his weaknesses in the postseason. And to me, he's the biggest choker in the history of the league. But at the same time, if you're going to say something good about Karl Malone, which there's not a lot of good things to say, but this is a basketball video, he was an amazingly consistent regular season performer. And if Charles Barkley had had his work ethic and durability, Barkley might have
have won a couple championships. But instead, they're both ringless, but at least Barkley is actually not a terrible human being. Shaquille O'Neal. For me, there were a couple players up for the last spot on this list, but I went with Shaq over David Robinson specifically because I felt Shaq was the more dominant player, even though Robinson did win a championship in the 90s, albeit as a second option behind Tim Duncan. One interesting thing to note is that for all of Shaq's dominance, he got swept five times in the decade, which is really just an interesting stat to me, although I don't really care because whether you're getting swept or you lose in six or seven, you still lost the series. It's basically two cheeks of the same ass. It's like, oh, we suck a little bit less than you. Okay, that's great. Player of the decade, Scottie Pippen. Just kidding. I know you Jordan fans were pissed for a second. Obviously, it's Michael Jordan. Let's move on. 2000s, Tim Duncan. The big fundamental sure left his mark on the first decade of the new millennium, winning two MVPs, three rings, and two finals MVPs in the stretch. He was a consistent playoff riser and somehow never won Defensive Player of the Year despite his teams and his defensive metrics always being incredible defensively. I will say that although a lot of people talk about him being underrated, I'm not sure he is. Some people might argue that his great moments don't get talked about as much as somebody like Kobe Bryant, and that might be true, but that cuts both ways. Playing in a small market like San Antonio might not get you as much national attention consistently, but your flaws and your shortcomings, as well as your playoff failures, also get forgotten about and less talked about as well. And for as great as Duncan was, he did have his down moments, just like every player. But nevertheless, when talking about the best players of the 2000s, Tim Duncan better be one of the very first names out of your mouth. Kobe Bryant. Kobe is also one of the toughest players to rank all time because he was great for most of his career, but not always, and he was a sidekick for the majority of his rings, yet he also later won championships as the best player. So there's a lot of context that needs to be applied. But there's no debate that Kobe is one of the best players of all time, and his best seasons came in the 2000s, so that's why he's here. Duh. He won four championships, an MVP, and a finals MVP in the decade, as well as some of the most famous scoring exploits in the history of the game, including an 81-point game against Toronto in 2006. Stylistically, he was a carbon copy of Michael Jordan, with amazing skill and technical abilities. My biggest gripe with Kobe as a player is that he wasn't a consistently great finals performer relative to his gargantuan standards, but his consistency and longevity makes him a must-add to any conversation about the greatest players of all time, specifically this decade. LeBron James. Because it's LeBron and a lot of people hate LeBron, they're probably going to say, why is he on this list? He didn't start winning championships until the 2010s. And for that, I say, go fuck yourself. 2000s LeBron is basically the equivalent of 1980s Michael Jordan. Incredible stats, freakish athleticism, an MVP, and no rings. But to me, the individual production on a per game level in both the regular and postseason was too much for him to be left off. Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq makes this list based off of the first three years of the decade where he had arguably the most dominant three-year stretch in the history of the league and won three straight championships and three straight finals MVPs as well as a league MVP. Of course, as we all know with Shaq, he pretty much fell off during the second half of the decade, but his peak was undeniably all-time great. And he also did win a fourth ring with Miami, although he wasn't the best player anymore. Dirk Nowitzki. To me, it was basically a toss-up between Dirk and KG, but I decided to go with Dirk because I felt he was a more consistent postseason performer than Garnett was, even though Garnett did win a championship in the decade while Dirk didn't, although we all know that KG needed to go to a super team in Boston to finally get it done. I think you could certainly argue that Garnett was more all-around skilled and talented than Dirk was, but at a certain point, production matters. And KG's postseason career with the Timberwolves was underwhelming, even considering the relative lack of talent that he had around him. Their resumes are extremely similar, and again, it is a toss-up, but I just went with the guy who I would trust in bigger moments more, and that is Dirk. Player of the decade, Tim Duncan. Now, this is kind of hard to explain because I have Kobe ahead of Duncan all time by a hair, but this is where the criteria that I had about specifically just this 10-year window and 75% of Kobe's rings, three out of four, he was the second best player on his own team, whereas Duncan was the clear-cut best player really for all three of his rings, even though Tony Parker did win finals MVP in 2007. Either way, Duncan had more rings as the best player on his team in the decade, as well as more finals MVPs and more MVPs. But again, I can certainly see an argument for Kobe. It's simply a little bit of bad luck for Kobe, as if you included the 2010 championship, which just missed my cutoff rule by one year, I would have given Kobe the edge. But as it stands, Duncan edges out Kobe for the best player of the 2000s in my mind. 2010s, LeBron James. During the decade, LeBron won three rings, three finals MVPs, and three MVPs. And if it wasn't for some bad time 
injuries like Kyrie getting hurt in 2015 and Kevin Durant joining the Warriors who just won 73 games, there would be no argument about who the best player ever is, but I digress. That's not what this video is about. Honestly, 2018 might have been LeBron's most impressive accomplishment even though it ended without a ring as he dragged a absolutely abysmal Cleveland Cavaliers team to the finals and should have won game one against the most talented team ever assembled. But again, I digress. I'm trying not to get angry here. Nevertheless, if you don't think LeBron was the best player of the decade while simultaneously holding him to higher standards than anybody else, you're a moron. Kevin Durant. While KD's all-time legacy is hotly debated, there is no doubt that regardless of how you might feel about him personally and his move to Golden State, he is one of the best players of all time and easily one of the best players of the 2010. He won an MVP and four scoring titles during the decade. He led OKC to a finals appearance in 2012. And yes, he did technically win two rings and two finals MVPs with unbelievable numbers in 2017 and 2018. But well, I could make a 50 minute video about that. But again, I digress. Steph Curry, famous respecter of housing development, Steph Curry has had a very unique path. Unlike most NBA superstars and legends who enter the league right away and very quickly become faces of the league, Steph flew under the radar for nearly the first four years of his career, but it was finally in year five where he broke out into an elite player, and then in year six, once Steve Kerr came along, that the beginning of the Warriors quote-unquote dynasty began. As I've gone into detail about a lot of other videos, Steph has had plenty of luck along the way, but there is just no debating that this guy completely warps the court more than any other player ever with his supernatural shooting ability. Even after his slow first half of the decade, he still finished the 10-year run with three championships, two MVPs, including his magical 2016 regular season, which is arguably the greatest offensive season any player has ever had. Arguably. He also famously blew a three-win lead in the finals, but again, I digress. I'm not supposed to be talking about that, but I can't help myself because at my heart, I am a shit poster. Because of his unbelievable shooting ability, you can make the argument that if there was an all-time draft and you could draft any player ever at their very best, Steph might be one of the top three or four players off the list. But that being said, there is no doubt that his legacy does take a hit to any Buddy having a good faith argument by recruiting Durant at his peak. Had Steph still won those two championships in 2017 and 2018 without Durant, which was certainly possible considering how great Golden State already was, I think there would be a lot less toxicity around where he ranks all time. Chris Paul. After the top three of LeBron, KD, and Steph, it becomes a little challenging actually to choose the rest of the five. But to me, Chris Paul's consistency in the regular season was just too much to ignore despite the fact that I've gone on record talking about about how much of a disappointment he usually is in the postseason. You could make the argument that regular season only, you could argue that only Magic Johnson is better than CP3. And I want to say in this scenario, I'm considering Steph as more of a hybrid guard as opposed to a point guard. But if you want to label Steph as a point guard, he gets put ahead of CP3 as well. Either way, CP3's longevity is amazing despite the fact that he's an easy meme nowadays. I do wonder if his career would have been any different had David Stern not vetoed his trade to the Lakers in 2011. And finally, James Harden. I've gone back and forth at least 50 times in my mind between Harden and Kawhi Leonard, but at the end of the day, I just could not ignore the gigantic mountain between the two in terms of production, even though I believe Kawhi in a vacuum, and especially in the playoffs, is a more trustworthy player than Harden, who's one of the biggest chokers ever. That being said, Harden in the regular season, especially during his time with Houston, is one of the best players the game has ever seen, whereas as Kawhi really didn't take off as an individual superstar player until his fifth or sixth season. You know what? I'm ranting a little bit here. Again, simple argument. Kawhi, a better big game performer, but just not nearly enough sample size compared to Harden to earn the final nod. Player of the decade, LeBron James. Now, I know some of you are going to try and be smart asses and say, oh, well, Steph Curry should probably be player of the decade, but anybody who's honest with themselves knows that the easy answer is LeBron. As I said before, three rings, three MVPs, three finals MVPs, and a ridiculous eight straight finals appearances in the decade gives King James the crown. Thanks for watching. If you haven't yet, please press that subscribe button. You will not regret it.